Tonight's teaching is on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as you might imagine, I have approached this topic and subject this week with much fear and trembling. From the standpoint that in the time allotted, I've been assigned the task of communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ in a meaningful, relevant, and motivating way. There is nothing that I'm aware of from a biblical point of view that takes priority over the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is of primary importance. And it's with that in mind that I invite you to join me in prayer as we ask God's blessing upon our time. Father in heaven, I thank you for this opportunity to talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you that you sent your son according to your plan that was forged in eternity past. Father, I thank you that he died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that all who call upon his name, all who exercise faith and belief in that gospel, all who repent of their sin will receive forgiveness of that sin through the gospel of your dear son. Father, we thank you for this truth. We pray that it might impact our lives anew this evening and that it might motivate us in the weeks to come. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Speaking of outlines, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about important terminology tonight, important terminology regarding the gospel. The first term that we're going to speak of is the phrase good news, and as many of you know, the word gospel in the New Testament is from a word that literally means good news or good report or glad tidings. The gospel is good news for those who receive it. The gospel is good news for those who believe it. Now, there are some Old Testament passages that actually present the good news. Some of you may not be aware of that, and I'd like to share a few of those with you. First of all, in Psalm 96, verses 1 to 3, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations. His wonderful deeds among all the peoples. So, even in the time of the Old Testament, this good news of the salvation of the God of Israel was not limited to the nation of Israel, but it was intended to be shared with all the nations. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. The Jews in and around Jerusalem were strategically pos uh, positioned in the center of the earth at the convergence of three continents in order that they might shout from the mountaintops the good news of the God of Israel. <clears throat> 
Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Isaiah chapter 52, verses 6 to 7. For those of you taking notes, you might want to jot down Nahum chapter 1 and verse 15, which is a cross-reference to this passage. It actually says pretty much word for word what Isaiah 52, 7 says. Beginning in verse 6. Therefore my people shall know my name. This is Jesus Christ speaking in the context. Therefore in that day, speaking of the time of his return to the earth, what we would call the second coming from our perspective. Therefore in that day, I am the one who is speaking here I am, utilizing the name of God in the Old Testament. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. That's what Jesus is going to announce on the mountains of Israel when his foot touches on the Mount of Olives. He is going to declare to the Jewish people, your God reigns, and he is going to announce that global peace has arrived. That's good news. Finally, from the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. This passage was quoted by Jesus early in his public ministry in the synagogue in Nazareth, as recorded by Luke in Luke chapter 4. When Jesus read from the scroll, which was the reading of the day, he stopped in the middle of verse 2, because the very next phrase talks about his second coming, the day of vengeance of our God. And when he finished the reading, he sat down and he said, Today, this Scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. He identified himself as the promised Messiah. He identified himself as God in the flesh. He identified himself as the one whom Isaiah spoke of and prophesied about in this verse and a half from Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news, to bring the gospel to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Well, good news, as we know, is not limited to the Old Testament. There are also a number of New Testament passages that speak to this principle. First of all, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 19. Now pick up the context in verse 18. And Zacharias said to the angel, How should I know this for certain? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Now, Gabriel is announcing the birth of John the Baptist. And in this encounter with Gabriel, Zachar Zacharias learns that the son which his wife will bear to him will be the forerunner to the Messiah himself. Certainly we would consider that good news. Then again in Luke chapter 2, very familiar passage in the Christmas story. The angels are out tending their flocks by night. Picking it up in verse 8, in the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. 
An angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terribly frightened. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which shall be for all the people. And what was that good news? For today, in the city of David, which is Bethlehem, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord who is the promised Messiah. He is the anointed one that the Old Testament prophets spoke about. He is a prophet like unto Moses. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws lying in a manger. Wrapped in the very material that was utilized by the priesthood In the city of Jerusalem, this little baby would be actually wearing priestly garments. That was the sign. In Acts 13, verse 32, a passage that we'll be looking at in in some detail later on this evening, in a sermon that the Apostle Paul preached, he says these words in verse 32. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the fathers. Now, another term that we need to consider at least for a little bit tonight is is this phrase, the gospel of the kingdom. Because this phrase is one of those phrases that is commonly misinterpreted. What is the gospel of the kingdom? The gospel of the kingdom is not about ushering in the kingdom through earthly effort without the presence of the king. That is not the gospel of the kingdom. It is often presented as such, but we need to understand what Jesus was saying And what John the Baptist was saying when they began their public ministries. And in order to understand that background, we have to go to the Old Testament. Specifically, we need to look at the book of Daniel. If you'll turn to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. I'm only going to read two verses, and I'm not going to set the context for you. This is a vision that Daniel has of four Gentile kingdoms leading up to the end of the age and the coming of the promised Messiah. I want you to look at verses 13 and 14. Daniel chapter 7. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. So if the kingdom was given to this son of man, what does that make the son of man? It makes the Son of Man the king if a kingdom was given to him, that all peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now turn over to Daniel chapter 9. Again, we don't have time to explain the context of the prophecy of the 77s, in Daniel 9, but I am going to read a single verse from that passage. I want you to take a look at Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26. Then after the 62 weeks or the 62 sevens, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. 
and the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So this tells us that after a certain amount of time, Messiah will die, and the city of Jerusalem and the temple are going to be destroyed. Now look at what it says in the verse previous to 26. Look at verse 25. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree, that's the starting point of this pro prophetic time clock, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince or Messiah the Ruler, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, it will be built again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. So at the very end of the 69th seven. Messiah, the ruler, will present himself in the context this has to do with the city of Jerusalem and the Jewish people. So the Jewish Messiah will present himself as their ruler at the end of the 69th seven. He will present himself as that ruler. Following that presentation after that, and the text here in Daniel 9 doesn't tell us how long after, he will be killed, and then after that, the city and the sanctuary will be destroyed. Well, we know from the New Testament that Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25 was fulfilled at the triumphal entry. All four Gospels record this event. That's very important. Anytime you have... A single event recorded by all four authors of the Gospels, that is a signal by the Holy Spirit for you to pay attention. And you should actually take the time to read each account, because there are details that might be in some and not in others. And you need to read all four accounts in order to get all the details. We're only going to look at Matthew's account this evening. So turn to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. <clears throat> when they approached Jerusalem and had come to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, Je then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says something to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Now this took place that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, and this is from a prophecy, Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you. Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the full of a beast of burden. Now flip over to Luke chapter 19, a second account, Luke chapter 19, the triumphal entry begins in verse 28, but we're going to pick up our reading in verse 41 of Luke 19. When he approached, he saw the city and wept over it. He's just been acclaimed. The, the multitudes have just shouted, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A quotation from Psalm 118, which is what the people were to say when Messiah came. They're, they're proclaiming Jesus as Messiah. And Jesus is weeping over the city. Why does he weep? It's because it's the end of the 69th seven. He's presented himself as king to the Jewish people, but the religious leaders have rejected his claim to Messiahship. They have not believed his message. They have not believed the Old Testament prophets concerning him. They have not believed Moses concerning him. They've rejected the Old Testament record. And because they've rejected Jesus as the Christ, 
most of the people will follow their lead into unbelief. And so Jesus has a heavy heart at this time. He says, if you had known in this day, what day? The day that he came to the city of Jerusalem, riding in on a donkey, in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy that declares him to be king, presenting himself as Messiah the ruler, to the city of Jerusalem and to the Jews who were living in and around Jerusalem. If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the day shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. It's talking about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. Why is this going to happen? Jesus tells them. Because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. On that particular day, he presented himself as king to the nation of Israel. And the religious leaders of that time, of that day, rejected that presentation. They did not receive the identity of Jesus Christ and his claims. And most of the people followed them in their unbelief. Now we need to have that firmly entrenched in our minds when we come to the opening chapters of the gospel accounts regarding the gospel of the, of the kingdom. For we read in uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. In what sense was he proclaiming the good news of the kingdom? He was saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's near. Why is it near? Because the king is here. He's present. He's going to offer himself as king. Now we, we know, looking back, that the nation rejected that offer of the kingdom the first time around. The second time around, the nation of Israel will accept that offer because the Jewish religious leaders at the end of the 70th 7 of Daniel will actually lead the people in belief, repenting from their sins, believing in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They will put their faith and trust in their Mashiach and they will believe what their forefathers had rejected. He proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom, healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now, it's important that we recognize the progression there. He's preaching. The message is the gospel of the kingdom, and that's being substantiated. That's being verified. That's being vindicated by messianic miracles. He was healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Jesus is who he claims to be. God in human flesh. Matthew chapter 9 verse 35 has a similar account. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now, we need to turn to Matthew chapter 9 in order to uh, fully appreciate what Matthew is recording here. Because the three verses prior to verse 35, there is a brief but interesting account of Jesus casting out a demon from a man who was unable to speak. I'm going to read verses 32 to 34 for you from Matthew chapter 9. As they were going out, behold, a dumb man, demon-possessed, was brought out to him. After the demon was cast out, the dumb man spoke, and the multitudes marveled, saying, Nothing like this was ever seen in Israel. It's the first time in Israel that this miracle had ever happened. And I'll explain to you why in just a moment. But the Pharisees were saying he cast out demons 
by the ruler of the demons. Now you need to understand how significant this particular miracle was. In Judaism, for a demon to be cast out, for a demon to be exercised, the rabbi or the religious leader was required to speak to the demon. In order to find out the demon's name so that the demon could be exercised or cast out. If the demon caused the man to be dumb or to not be able to speak, to be mute, the Jewish exor exorcists were absolutely powerless against that demon. And it was taught that only the Messiah would be able to cast out such a demon since it wasn't required for the Messiah to speak to the demon and find out the demon's name. He could just, by his own authority, cast the demon out. And since the Messiah had never come, this miracle had never been performed in Israel. And when it was performed in Matthew chapter 9, the people took notice and they were astonished. When we read parallel accounts, we, we, we find questions like, this could not be the son of David, could it? And what was the response of the Jewish religious leadership? They couldn't deny the miracle. They couldn't deny that it happened, so they tried to discredit the miracle. This man casts out demons by the ruler of the demons. It's a phrase they'll use in Matthew chapter 12 when a similar miracle takes place, as well as Luke chapter 11, which is a parallel account. <clears throat> they can't deny the miracle happened. They're not willing to acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah, so they attempt to discredit Jesus by saying, he casts out demons by the prince of demons. <clears throat> Finally, in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, we read these words. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. This is in the Olivet Discourse. And Jesus is saying that the gospel of the kingdom, the good news of the coming kingdom, will be pre preached throughout the entire world, and then the end will come. What end is he talking about? He's talking about the end of this present age, which will conclude when Jesus returns to this planet bodily to establish a kingdom that will never end. The gospel of the kingdom is the good news, not about the kingdom, but the good news about the king. And if you don't have the king, you don't have the kingdom. Even Philip, when he preached the gospel of the kingdom in Acts chapter 8, he was, in the days of the early church, pointing the people to the soon return of Jesus Christ. Because we know from Scripture, starting with the ascension of Jesus Christ, we've been in the last days. Finally, we need to look at the terms repent and repentance. And there's some Old Testament passages I want to share with you very quickly. Job chapter 42, verse 6. Therefore I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. This is spoken by a man that God says on more than one occasion that he was blameless, righteous, and forsook evil. That was God's testimony of Job. But when Job had an encounter with the creator God of heaven and earth, he recognized his knees or his need to fall down on his knees and to repent of his sin as a sinner before God. You see, righteous people need to repent 
Repentance isn't simply for unbelievers. Repentance is for everyone who is a sinner. If it's good enough for Job, it's good enough for us. Ezekiel 14.6 Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, Repent and turn away from your idols, turn your faces away from all abominations. The word repentance, it means to turn away. We turn away from our sin, and in turning away from our sin, we turn toward God. It's a 180 degree turn. And that's the meaning, not only in the Old Testament, but also in the New. One last reference from the Old Testament, Ezekiel 18, verses 30 to 32. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, each according to his conduct declares the Lord God. <coughs> Repent and turn away from all your transgressions or all your sins so that iniquity may not become a stumbling block to you. Cast away from you all your transgressions which you have committed and make yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore, repent and live. God desires all men to come to repentance. He wants people to live. He doesn't want people to die. But if they refuse to repent of their sin, he will judge that sin, and he will hold them accountable. Okay, let's talk about metanaeo, which is the verb form of the word repent. Uh, it it literally means to change your mind. And again, it has this sense of turning, turning from sin and turning toward God. And it's, it's amazing how much the New Testament emphasizes repentance in relation to the gospel and in relation to the forgiveness of sins. It's clear and it's unmistakable. Matthew chapter 3, verse 2. These are the first recorded words out of the mouth of John the Baptist. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus was about ready to present himself. John was preparing the way for his cousin, who was the promised Mashiach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Chapter 4, verse 17. These are the first recorded words of Jesus Christ from the Gospel of Matthew. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Excuse me. These are the, uh, not the first recorded words. This is early in the public ministry of Jesus, uh, following uh, his temptation uh, in, in the wilderness. Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 and 21. He began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Those cities on the northwest shore of the city of Galilee, Bethsaida and Chorazin, Jesus performed so many miracles in, in those cities that he held them accountable to repent of their sin. He gave them clear, unmistakable evidence as to his identity. They refused to believe. Look at what he says. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Matthew chapter 12, verse 41. This is speaking in judgment of the religious leaders of Israel and the generation which followed the scribes and Pharisees in unbelief. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Jonah preached a message of repentance to the most ungodly, brutal, cruel, barbaric nation the world had known up to that point in time. They repented as a people. 
and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. And of course, he was speaking of himself. So let's look at the word metanoia. Metanoia is the noun form. Metanoia, the verb form. Metanoia, the noun form. Luke chapter 3, verse 3. He came into the, all the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance. This is John the Baptist now. Preaching a baptism of repentance. And what was that baptism for? It was for the forgiveness of sins. So people who responded in faith to John's message were baptized. And because they responded in faith to that message about the coming Messiah, they were forgiven of their sins. Luke chapter 24, verses 46 to 47. He said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. That's the Great Commission. This is Luke's version of the Great Commission. This is the gospel. And Jesus is saying, I had to die and rise the third day in order that repentance for the forgiveness of sins might be proclaimed. That's why I came. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 17. This is speaking of Esau. It's in one of the five warning passages in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 17, the fifth and final warning passage. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. We need to be clear about something. When people repent of their sin, it's not simply a matter of being sorry or regretting what they've done. It's a matter of turning from their sin toward God for forgiveness. Understanding, recognizing that they could never do it on their own. Esau was sorry. Esau regretted what he had done. But he didn't repent in faith and belief. And that's why he was rejected. Finally, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 tells us, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. How many people does God desire to come to repentance? Everyone. He wants everyone to come to repentance. Sadly, it's the minority that repent most do not. Okay. Let's move to the second point of our outline. I will tell you that um, this second point doesn't take as long as the first one. Uh, the first one is, was necessary in order to kind of serve as the backdrop in the background for what I'm going to share uh, out of these important texts. The first important text is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. And if you would turn there, if you have your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the resurrection chapter. And this is the chapter that is most often cited when someone wants to succinctly declare what the Bible identifies as the gospel of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 8. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, or the good news, which also you received, or believed, in which also you stand, 
by which also you are saved. Talking about the present, the present principle of salvation. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance. Now, this is what I understand this passage to say. It is the most important thing I could ever write to you, Corinthian believers. It is of first importance. It is of primary importance. What I also received, and he received it from Jesus Christ directly, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to a number of people following his resurrection. Now, I used to teach that there's two facts to the Gospels, to the Gospel, the death and resurrection of Christ. From this passage, I used to teach that the burial of Christ is mentioned as a proof that he actually died, and that appearing to eyewitnesses is proof that he actually arose. Now, it's true that being buried is proof that he died, because no Roman soldier in his right mind would bury somebody who was still alive because his life was on the line. And it, it, it's also true that these eyewitness resurrection appearances are irrefutable proof that Jesus Christ did indeed fulfill prophecy and arise from the dead. But this passage teaches more than that. It teaches that the burial of Christ is part of the gospel as well. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a moment. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. This is the great sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. And again, there is so much information in this passage. I'm only going to share you a little sliver. But it's an important sliver as it relates to the gospel. Beginning in verse 22, he writes these words. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. So that's talking about the death of Jesus Christ for sins. And it wasn't simply the fact that the Jewish religious leaders wanted to kill him. It was part of the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. It was according to the plan of God. And it happened on a particular day. It happened on the feast of Passover, on Nisan 14. And it fulfilled the Old Testament feast of Passover. Now, does anybody know on what day Peter preached this sermon? It was on the day of Pentecost, which is also known as the Feast of Weeks, which is the fourth feast of seven feasts in in the Jewish religious calendar. There's three in the spring. There's one in the, uh, excuse me, four in the spring, and then there's Three in the fall. Three of the four in the spring happen in rapid succession. Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. And then near the end of spring, there's this feast of weeks that happens 50 days after 
the Feast of First Fruits, and that's the day of Pentecost. And this is the day that Peter is preaching. He's preaching on a Jewish feast day, a day that the Jews were commanded to be in Israel to offer sacrifices at the temple. There was over a million people there that day. It was by design. And Peter is preaching a message that's focusing on three different feasts of Yahweh. The feast of Passover, the death of Christ. And then, he, and then he says, verse 24, God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in his power. For David says of him, I was always beholding the Lord in my presence, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad, my tongue was exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will abide in hope, because thou wilt not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow thy Holy One to undergo decay. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou wilt make me full of gladness with thy presence. So he, he quotes from, Act, or excuse me, from uh, Psalm 16, and we're going to focus particularly on verse 10. You will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow thy Holy One to undergo decay. This is in reference to the burial of Jesus Christ. And he was buried during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which lasted for a week from the 15th of Nisan, the day after the Feast of Passover, for seven days. And Jesus was put in the tomb before the Feast of Unleavened Bread even began. He was put in the tomb before sundown at the end of the day of Passover. Because you couldn't touch a corpse on the Sabbath. So they had to prepare his body quickly. So he died on Passover. He's in the grave. He's in the tomb during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. What does unleavened bread have to do with the burial of Jesus Christ? Well, it's pretty simple. Unleavened bread is bread which has not been corrupted. You understand, leaven corrupts bread. How many people are in here are fans of sourdough bread? Sourdough bread. Okay, sourdough bread is bread that is in the initial stages of decomposition. That's what makes it taste so good. That's what leaven does. It decomposes the bread. God did not want his people to be eating bread, which would be in the process of de decomposing, because he didn't want them to remain in Egypt because their lives were on the line. So he said, don't add any leaven. Eat unleavened bread. And it's a reminder of their hasty retreat from Egypt. But it's also a picture of Jesus Christ in the grave. Because God did not allow the physical body of Jesus to decompose. He was in the tomb for a very short period of time. That was predicted by the Old Testament. His burial is part of the gospel. It's a fulfillment of the second feast of Yahweh. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then, of course, we have the Feast of First Fruits, which is the resurrection. And that's already been referred to in this passage. Pick it up in verse 29. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried. His tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants upon his throne... He looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. Jesus had to rise again rather quickly following his death. That's why he said, I'm going to rise on the third day. He was only in the, in the tomb for a matter of hours on Nisan 14, before sundown. All of Nisan 15... And then for the opening hours of Nisan 16, which was the Feast of first fruits, So you had 14, 15, and 16 in succession that were, were being celebrated by the Jewish people. And Jesus Christ, in that three-day period, fulfilled the first three feasts of Yahweh because those feasts spoke of him. 
And when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, it was a picture of what God had done at Mount Sinai. Remember Mount Sinai? Lightning, thunder, fire. There was this rushing wind, tongues of fire. And instead of the giving of the law, there was the giving of the Spirit. And instead of 3,000 Jews being killed, 3,000 Jews were added to the body of Christ on the day of Pentecost. So the first four feasts of Yahweh have been fulfilled. Now, I don't have time to break down for you Acts 13, 14 to 43, but I will tell you it follows the exact same pattern as Acts 2. I, I was not aware of that. Uh, as much as I've studied Acts 13 in the past, I, I, I kind of stumbled on this this week, that it follows this pattern of the death in verses 28 and 29, the burial, verses 34, 35, and 37, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 30, 33, 34, and 37. Taken together, you have the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, my wife always encourages me to at least say a word about the so what. <laughs> so what if Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures? Well, here's the so what. Romans chapter 1. Verses 1 through 4, and then I'll pick it up in verse 9. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scripture. The gospel of Jesus Christ was promised beforehand by the Old Testament prophets. Concerning his son, who was a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 9. For God, whom I serve in my spirit, in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. Verse 14. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and the foolish, Thus, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Who's he writing to? He's writing to the believers in the church at Rome. And he wants to come preach the gospel to them. It's not simply for unbelievers. Believers need to hear the gospel. We need to hear it often. We need to hear it consistently. Because it reminds us of where we came from, but it also reminds us of our need to keep short accounts with sin. And it motivates us to share that news with people that don't yet know. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith.